Today we're going to discuss the most important but least understood success factors of innovation. So basically five exciting things. Why there is a growing need for change, what setup is required to win, how to creating an unfair advantage, how to understand your customers' important but unmet customer needs, we're equally going to discuss the exciting domain of business model innovation and where to cut costs and where to innovate. All of what you're going to see here is basically fully shared open source. This is one of the models which I'm just sharing here. It's the Unite Navigator. And generally all of those Unite models are proudly shared open source. You can access and download all of them at digitalleadership.com slash unite. Without further ado, let's get kicking. A growing need for change. Why is there a growing need for change? So here you see the longevity of organizations and how it developed. So in the 1930s, organizations lived for up to a century. They were listed in the S&P 500, one of the largest stock indices. And we are seeing the trend is going down we're expecting organizations to be listed in the S&P for just 10 to 15 years. Now, why is that happening? Because shortening life expectancy is bad news for organizations and for us as societies. We are basically seeing examples of exponentially accelerating change across literally all industries. And here are just some of the examples. So 3D printing has massively come down a price drop of 100, so by a factor of 100 over the last 15 years or so. Industrial robots, the first good industrial robots are now available at 10K dollars. Yeah. Drones are now sold in supermarkets to a retail audience and so on and so forth. And if we just look at this, it took chat GPT just two months to reach 100 million users. It took the radio 70 years to get to 50 million users. Mobile phone 16 years, chat GPT just two months. So we are seeing that's just one more example of accelerating change. Now, if we basically take a long term perspective and look at the waves of industrial revolution, we can see that they are shortening. So basically every wave of industrial revolution is coming faster than the previous one. And indeed, perhaps already the term industrial revolution might be outdated because today we're very much living in a service innovation. Just 20% of the GDP of the industrialized nation, so to speak, is still about industry, the rest is, is service. And therefore, perhaps you shouldn't be talking about industrial revolution, but basically we are right now in the second information revolution and are moving towards information 3.0. Now, if you look at what is happening, it's always technological new possibilities that have driven those industrial or you know, information revolutions. But what we have to acknowledge as well is that it always took a related cultural revolution to benefit of the industrial revolution. So the steam power and water power couldn't have happened, couldn't have been led to productive um, means huh? without the related cultural revolution of the division of labor. And what we're seeing right now, we are seeing another cultural revolution happening as we move from industry 2.0 to industry 3.0 to industry 4.0 to the first to the second information revolution, we are seeing that the paradigm is entirely changing. Value creation is coming back to people, to smart people, to knowledge workers who are enabled, who are thinking in networks where project management instead of line management, where we don't lead through control anymore, but through trust. Work-life balance is out, huh? it's work-life blending. And how we manage ourselves is no more through centralized and steep pyramids, but it's becoming circular organizations with a collegial type of leadership. 
Now, if you look at innovation, digitalization, and transformation in general, it's not just a technology game. While technology is important and data and analytics, it's just one of those areas we have to think about. Indeed, digitalization is basically a much broader picture. It's about your digital business strategy, your ecosystem, your business model. It's about your staff, how you engage with your customers. It's about your processes and structure, as well as your value structure, how you, your value change, ultimately your value propositions. And all that is enabled by informed decision making and the ability to execute. That is a much more complete view of digitalization. So when we speak about digitalization or innovation for that matter, we always have to look at the much more complete picture. The first bigger topic I want to discuss today are the three horizons of growth. So basically an organization can develop alongside three horizons of growth. The first one is digitalization or digitization. So think about a paper which is suddenly becoming a PDF. It's not smart yet, but it's digitized for the first time. That is the domain of horizon one. We are executing the usual core business and we are improving it, but only in a very much iterative fashion. Now a transformation is a much bigger change. A transformation comes from the Latin word transformare, which means to make a step change to something. So in a digital transformation, we're making a step change to our business model. Innovation means to make something new in nature and something radical. So whenever we speak about innovation, it's something radical. It's no more a step change. We are moving on to a very different paradigm. These are the three horizons of growth, but what do they indeed mean? Now in horizon one, and I'm sorry for the big table, but you have to understand this. Huh? So in horizon one, we are working inside the existing business and we are working on exploiting current resources and capabilities. Our approach is one of execution and sustaining. We are operating within the existing business model and are making incremental changes to it. If we look at the opposite in the space of innovation, we are working outside of the organization. And if you're working inside the organization, you're probably wrong to start with. Our objective and purpose is to create new avenues of growth. And we're in the search to build a radically new business model. Indeed, that is also the definition of a startup. So a startup is often in the desperate search of a new business model. And once it has found one, then it is trying to scale it with a means of technology. So here we are in the unknown. We are searching for a business model. We are in the new radical. The core competency is on the strategic intent is innovation. And the core competency is an entrepreneurial one. We are seeking to develop new business and services. We are trying to create breakthrough innovation and we need to be highly adaptable. adaptable. So if we go back to the opposite in Horizon 1, the core competency of the strategic intent is reducing costs and increasing profits. The core competency is an operational one. The critical task is therefore one of efficiency of operations of incremental improvement. The expected risk is low because we're operating in a known business and known context. The potential reward, however, is equally low. So typically we expect single digit returns. Look at the innovation side of things. It is high. The risk is high, but the reward is also high. So ideally we hope to create triple digit growth per annum. This is just the high level view of the way of thinking. And basically what you're seeing here is everything changes radically depending on which horizon you're operating in. Everything changes. And that is why I'm discussing this with you guys today is if you're innovating or creating a transformation or executing is a radically so radically 
that to be successful, you have to wonder about where you are and what setup you require to be successful. So let's go through some of those um, contexts here. So I, th I think the context is more or less understood. The organizational structure is a big one. No? So in Horizon 1, we said we're working inside the core business. And so necessarily, we need to specialize. How do we specialize? Well, through the division of work. How do we do that? Well, we build hierarchies as we have, as we have always been doing. However, when you're innovating, you're suddenly outside of the organization because inside you would be stuck in those pyramids and in those hierarchies and in the division of work. Versus in innovation, you need something else. You need the brains of all involved. You need a much more T-shaped people. You need more circular type of thinking. You have entirely flat organizations, circular in nature. Holacracy might be one of the types of innovation. And the approach you take in Horizon 1 is therefore one of process management because your processes are stable and defined. So you're looking for repeatability and you're seeking to produce low Errors. Errors are absolutely not allowed in Horizon 1. Just imagine if um, your flights don't arrive on time or even if your flights falls off uh, and, and the airplane crashes. Um, unthinkable. Banks have to be stable. In Horizon 3, it's the opposite. You develop a minimum pro viable product. You're trying to be agile. You're managing uncertainties. Highest risk of first, etc. And so the way you work with controls and KPIs as in Horizon 1, you're working on you're improving your margins, you're trying to squeeze more productivity. Yeah? In Horizon 3, you're measuring very differently. You don't care about margins. To start with, you have to find a new business model that is working. So you're focusing on learning and growth metrics. Am I learning what matters? And you're trying to understand your customers better. That is how you indeed measure progress here. Leadership and team equally changes. So you go from highly specialized experts to entrepreneurial leaders, from a top-down structure to one where the leaders are operationally involved. You close knowledge, knowledge gaps on the left in Horizon 1 with internal ex ex expertise on Horizon 3. You're very much required to learn from the outside because you don't know better. So you're asking customers, you're involving Marketing totally changes. You're going from working with existing customers to whom you churn out products to entirely new customers. And that is what's most likely to happen. Even if you think you're going to work with existing ones, typically as you change your value structure, your value proposition, etc., typically you find yourself working with new types of customers. And that is why you need to learn from those and that's why you're doing small, say, small scale samples. You're asking. Managing risks, of course, changes because in Horizon 1 you have low uncertainty. Yeah? Can we optimize cost and performance? In Horizon 3 the risk, however, is high. So you have to constantly adjust costs. You're pivoting, as we say. Um, how do you work together with others? Well, in Horizon 1, you're trying to gain access to re resources. You prolong your workbench. You, your partnership model is actually not really one. You're working through procurement in a cost-driven approach. You know, fixed time, fixed price, budgeting, let, etc. In Horizon 3, you're trying to find an pa external partner to help your external partners. You're sharing the success because nobody knows it's a high-risk environment. You're trying to work with the best, therefore. In terms of technology setup, well, here again, something interesting is happening. In Horizon 1, we are, we're talking about best practices and the adoption of the same. But when you think about best practice, I mean, a best practice is a best practice because it's well established. So indeed, a best practice, no more best practice. It's a standard practice. So the objective of Horizon 1 is to adapt standard practices, large scale IT, the required stability and the development approach is still often release management and even waterfall which makes sense because you can plan in an environment which is predominantly stable if your environment however becomes unstable 
as in Horizon 3, when you're innovating, then you need to go outside of enterprise IT. You need lightweight, nimble structures, which you can easily change. Time to market is way more critical than perfection because you're not going for something error free and you will have mixed teams which are working in an agile mode organized in short sprints. Now, of course, this was super fast, but I think you got the main message here. When you're creating, when you're working and launching a new initiative, think about if you're truly improving something existing. If you're transforming something existing, then you're in the domain of digital transformation. Or if you're really doing radical innovation, in which case you must leave the building and build the required practices and required setup. Most organizations don't do that. And to me, that is the number one failure why organizations struggle to create innovation. Now, if you look at the organizational structure, what does that really mean? Horizon One is typically led by the COO, the chief operating, the chief marketing and the chief financial officer. They are working on keeping this ship steady, slowly advancing with incremental improvements and changes. However, in Horizon Three, it can't be the same guys, right? Because Competencies, people, structures, rules, marketing approaches, feedback, learning mechanisms, everything as we just discussed changes. So here we need to put the Horizon 3 business, basically radical innovation under the leadership of a chief new business officer or somebody like that, who himself owns an incubation department, which is in charge of generating new projects, new approaches and then accelerating those who are done well. And here we see another key issues. First of all, organizations are not set up in that way. Innovation is typically taking care of the existing business in Horizon 1. But no wonder it doesn't work. I mean, how, how could you possibly expect that? And second, while most organizations, most very large organizations at least, do have an incubator, very few ones have the capabilities to accelerate growth. But where do you want to go if you don't know how to accelerate something? And this is why, while there are many good ideas coming out of large organizations, very few manage to get to a size which is relevant because simply they are failing to be accelerated. And the Horizon One structure can't do that. They have a much bigger business and a different purpose to take care of instead of accelerating a small startup idea. And that's why it's not happening. Organizations give birth to good ideas, at least sometimes, but then they fail to grow them because they don't have the required organizational structure. Another topic which I would love to discuss with you today is how to play to your strengths. So any business can be divided into three broad sections. The non-core areas, the core areas and the differentiating ones. 80% of a business is basically non-core. It's basically processes which are not even industry specific. The way you do marketing, the way you do finances, the way you do HR, even the way you produce is most likely not even industry specific for at least 80% of the processes. Even production is typically done by the same Chinese robots who are just assembling something out of slightly different materials. And if you think about that, well, what does it mean as a business objective if 80% is not even industry specific? Well, that means we have to radically standardize and cut costs. The objective is here to meet market requirements at the lowest possible costs. Here our strategic focus is to improve costs, to improve competitiveness. Now the core areas, these are about 15% of an organization's processes. These are industry specific now, but basically here you're not superior to the competition. 
these are your areas of relative strengths. This is where you compete head to head. While you're strong in there, you don't have competitive advantage. So from a business objectives perspective, you want to increase competitiveness here, meet your customers needs, defend your call, streamline, increase efficiency where possible. And in the differentiating areas, they are about 5% only of the processes inside your organizations. These are the activities that really differentiate you. Here you want to um, drive value, drive differentiation, build ideally best in world capability. Here you want to invest to support in differentiation, expand on and invest in those areas. So basically any business can be divided in non-core core and differentiating. The big news is most of a business is non-core. That's where we standardize. And only a few percentage points are really supporting to drive value and differentiation. That has major consequences. How do you differentiate now between non-core core and differentiating areas? Well, basically you're looking at the capabilities your business has. The Unite Business Capability Map is one such breakdown, um, dividing a business into leadership capabilities, operating capabilities, as well as proprietary assets and capabilities. Now you can simply ask yourself, the way you do sourcing, supply chain logistics, is that non-core or are you differentiating with it? Or the way you do marketing and sales, is that non-core, core, or are you truly differentiating in those ways? Now that is of course a high level perspective. You can equally go much more detail. Yeah? So here is another perspective of a tool we're sharing. But similarly, again, it's lists of capabilities which allow you to break down your business into those non-core coin differentiating areas to define and derive appropriate strategies for those. Another key topic in innovation, what normally goes wrong, is understanding your customer needs. And I do have a very simple question. Where do I go for dinner tonight? Do I go to a nice bar or do I go to a formal dining place? And I guess it's tough to answer. So let me help you and let me provide you some more information. So basically the gentleman you see here is a typical representative of a segment. You know? This is what is called a persona. A persona being a typical representative of a segment. The segmentation theory is basically called to how we market. Yeah? So we think about which segments have similar needs and how do we push messages to those. But segmentation is also the core towards product development. Because we're thinking when we build a new product, we think about, well, who would be actually using that? How would we actually do this? Who would consume that? So now since you have a lot more information about me being a representative of a certain segment, I'm asking you once more, well, where do I go tonight for dinner? Now you have all those information about me and perhaps even a lot more, who knows? I mean, just imagine you had all the relevant information about me, everything you could possibly imagine including my taste preferences. Could you now answer, where am I going for dinner? And the thing is, probably not. Not with significant likelihood. But if I would just offer you one more piece of information, then you could easily tell that. So tonight, I'm going to meet my old student friends and we're going out. Now I think everybody knows now, now basically with very high probability, Stefan is going to the nice bar. But if I'm going to take out a new customer for dinner for the first time, then it's equally clear. I'm probably taking the customer to the formal dining place. So what we have to understand is not segmentation criteria and more and more detailed personas. It's not that what is driving a decision. What is driving a decision is what 
do people actually want? What is their need? Yeah. Do I take out my students group or do I take out a customer? And here's some more examples. So people don't want to buy a power drill. They want a painting on the wall and perhaps they don't want a painting on the wall. They might want their room to look nice where they live. And their room to look nice can be achieved with paintings, with plants, with Bangut Olufsen loudspeakers because they look beautiful, with a colorful wall or with n other things. So if you look at it this way, it changes your competitive dynamics. The entire field of competition changes. People don't want a TV, they want to be entertained. People don't want to scale, they want to look good. And people, or if you look at a business example, well, a business doesn't need a fry train, they need a solution to have goods transported. Let's take one look at another example, which most of us can relate to. So if you go to a supermarket, you find wines typically organized by price and by country. So, I mean, yes, you, you differentiate between sparkling, white, rosé and reds. But then normally it's by countries and by price. So I know I'm serving spaghetti with clams tonight. And I have a bottle of 2018 Chateau Marguerite. And I have another bottle, say, of 2016 Cadifrati. This is what is in the supermarket. Now, most people can't answer that question because only two people are hardcore wine aficionados and are therefore comfortable to tell you, well, which is good. So what we have done for one of the largest supermarket chains is reorganize all those wines by way more practical things. I need a wine that goes with fish because I'm serving spaghetti with clams tonight. Or I'm organizing a nice dinner with friends where I'm serving steak. And then it's very clear. The Cadifrati goes in the fish region. The Chateau Magritte is something that you would serve with a steak. The result was a 30% uptake in wine purchases. Overnight, after we have implemented that, both online as well as in the store, Wine sales would increase by an astonishing 30%. People felt more comfortable buying because they knew what they needed and what they wanted. The big lesson learned is that methodology is called jobs to be done. It's the single most important and best methodology to understanding what people want. We go away from luck to a targeted approach to identifying a customer need. And that should be the basis of innovation. We don't want to get more inventive about it and do more ideation. Indeed, that entire ideation piece can't work to start with. Even if you create 500 ideas, I mean, how do you know they're relevant? Are these ideas leveraging, um, are they spot on, uh, on important, but unmet customer needs? It's unclear, huh? you just don't know. Second, do they leverage those ideas you just had? Do they leverage um, differentiating cap capabilities in your business? Well, you don't know either. So that entire piece of ideation is not a good approach for innovation, not a sound basis for innovation. What you want is to identify important but unmet customer needs. Another topic I would like to discuss with you today is the domain of business model innovation. Now, I think you know basically what a business model canvas is. It's a depiction of a business model and it is arranged in a couple of key pieces. Here you see the Unite version of the business model canvas. And I don't want to discuss why exactly in details right now, but just believe me for a second, it's superior. So what you see here is the core business model canvas alongside the key questions you have to ask yourself to fill it out proficiently. Now you can also contextualize that business model. 
on the top you now see the drivers on the right you see the customers segments and their jobs to be done at the bottom you're seeing the team who is executing on it on the left you see the outcome which is hopefully that your new business model is creating an unfair advantage so here is the business model canvas again slightly zooming in and you can more zoom in on the value proposition we suddenly can see your core customer needs based on jobs to be done product services as well as your new understanding of competing solutions but even from here you can zoom in for example you could zoom in to the elevator pitch let's zoom out one more and let's zoom out from the business model canvas so here is the business model environment canvas basically business models don't live in a vacuum they live in a competitive context so here you can break down the competitive context by emerging trends and disruptive forces with which you can analyze your business environment and once you have done all of those pieces from the you went from on that beautiful journey from business model to elevator pitch to value proposition to environment canvas well you have that draft for your new innovation you could ask yourself oh is that now a promising business model the business model's core card asks you the 12 most toughest questions on your business model it's based on analysis of over 600 startups and their failures or their successes so it asks you do you have does your business model offer a lock in effect do you have a well-structured cost structure and is it imitable for example basically what i want to discuss is for the first time the tools are connected these are just some examples so here we are seeing the entire business model framework with setting the business model in context so you can go from anywhere to anywhere in the center we see the business model canvas on the top right you break it down with a value proposition canvas you analyze your customers jobs to be done oh team suddenly the topic of culture comes into play how do i structure that team or you can go just one more example from operating model from the business model to an operating model defining your core value stream as well as the supporting activities your organization runs but i think i promised to talk at least briefly about the topic of business model innovation now business model innovation is in principle well understood we know for example how we can earn money yeah that is happening through the revenue model and how money can be earned has been experimented by millions of organizations over the last hundreds of years so we know how we can charge money for our products we equally well understand how we can set up brand or communicate with our customers so the only thing we had to do is to break those areas down so we took the operating model blue just watch the colors value model uh, yellow experience model green etc revenue model dark gray and literally map those out so now you can suddenly see what are the main patterns in each of those areas and if you want to reinvent your revenue model on the top left well you could think about oh add-on pricing how about a switch to advertising based pricing or a broker or cash up front or i make a flat flat rate offer, offering towards my customers or a create a false scarcity premium pricing subscription pricing auctioning yeah so here you basically find 90 to 95 percent of the most important patterns of a business so when you want to do business model innovation you basically start defining your business model canvas start with the core canvas or the extended business model canvas and then you define each area as you are today and then you pick one area for example 
again the topic of revenue model you define it how it is today then you go for here is the detail table including definitions look at all your possible alternatives and you see when you make a change in your revenue model in this case in this example whether you have made progress and then you take that step by step area by area so basically business model innovation is a highly structured process that you take and a highly methodological process which you take step by step area by area look at the alternatives and see whether you have made progress business model innovation is the most important potentially most impactful way of doing innovation and it's unfortunate it is not being used so we always do product innovation marketing innovation but business model innovation is least understood possibly by organizations out there it has big potential because as you do a couple of steps as a couple of moves in innovating your business model innovation at innovating your business model your business model becomes more defensible it's tougher to copy it's more differentiated so go out and leverage the unite business model innovation patterns another key topic i want to briefly touch upon is creating and designing a digital transformation so again here is a business model and we said initially that a transformation is a step change to an existing business model so here is one example let's say you're a company and you have thus far been selling through a distributor network which was in your country and let's say you're now moving instead of selling your products through that distributor network you're now selling your products online you're going e-commerce so basically if you look at that innovation the main innovation is a channel innovation you're now selling directly to consumers online instead of through a distributor network as you do that while your customer relationships and how you engage with those is entirely changing you're not engaging with them directly instead of the distributor your brand might be changing thus far you might have had a b2b brand now you need a b2c one because you're selling online perhaps your revenue model the bottom right is changing because customers are not buying your product in stores anymore but are buying it online there is no service really anymore behind it the service model might be changing because your distributor network is no more servicing your product so you have to do that by yourself so your value proposition might become actually slightly lower because while well, people are expecting a different price service only happening online so perhaps you have a lighter version but you may be able to upgrade it with your product system these are just some of the ways how a change in your channel as you go from distributor to e-commerce online how you might be able how you might be needing to change your business model the big and important thing and this is where most digital transformations fail is building an e-commerce online sales channel is not so difficult adjusting the rest of the business model to that newly found e-commerce model that is the difficult piece and that is why most of the digital transformations fail the core challenge of a digital transformation is not just identifying what could possibly be changed but changing the entire rest of the business model in function of the main change you're carrying out to again create a harmoniously working together structure that is the core challenge of a digital transformation that is why a digital transformation is actually surprisingly similar to an innovation you need to take a digital transformation initiative outside of the house reconfigure your entire business model so it works again harmoniously together 
And once you have achieved such a fit across all areas of a business model, once you know how the new business model needs to operate, you bring back that innovative change back into the organization. That is really the transformation part of it through a big effort of change management. And it's in essence, digital transformation. Now, another way you can be looking at transformation is, okay, how do I find new growth in it? And this is where the Unite Exponential Growth Canvas might come in handy. It's again, basically based on the topic, on the, on the structure of the business model canvas or the extended business model canvas, which you came to meet earlier. And what we did here is just logically breaking down in which area you could have which type of changes. So the Unite Exponential Growth Canvas offers you the guiding questions you need to ask yourself what you should be changing or what you could consider changing in your business model to achieve strong growth or even exponential one. A last big topic I would love to discuss today is where to innovate and where to cut costs. And I think we already discussed it. So you divide a business into non-core, core and differentiating areas. And most of a business is non-core. Now you can also map the non-core, core and differentiating areas to corresponding business and IT strategies. So in the non-core areas, the 80%, you're improving the existing business by aligning it with standard practices. You work on operational excellence you digitize or digitalize smartly, not just copying offline processes. In terms of IT strategy, this is where you standardize and outsource. And you rely on standard software or software as a service. So SAP might be the, um, the, 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 the a case which we all can relate to SAP software. And when you introduce SAP software, you're indeed not only buying a system, but you're buy, buying a set of standard or best practice operating procedures. What you want to do with those is implement them without changes. As you change an existing process, operating process, which is best and standard practice to something else, while well, it's no more best and standard practice. And that makes the implementation difficult in terms of system implementation, but also you're getting away from best and standard practices. So avoid customization wherever possible and consider outsourcing. Your business adapts in the non-core areas to the best and standard practices, not the other way around. SAP is not adapting to your business. Your business needs to adapt in the non-core areas to the standard. In the core areas, you're transforming your existing business. You might be looking into undeveloped adjacencies, leveraging hidden corporate capabilities and assets, expanding into new segments and markets. And in terms of IT strategy, you're looking at licensing, joint development with competitors. So here the principle of co-opetition. You might consider early standards adaptation. And here you might want to customize to increase value because here you're battling head to head with the competitors. In the differentiating areas, this is where you want to innovate to strengthen those few areas of your business, which are really supporting your differentiation. So here you want to do business model innovation, marketing innovation, product innovation, other types of innovation. Typically you would be working here in your value and service model. And you're looking from an IT perspective, you're looking at in-house development to build best in world capability and support those. Here you're jumping early on new technologies, on emerging technologies and investing in proprietary systems to differentiate. Again, on those non-core core and differentiating areas, have a look at the capability map we discussed. Let me try to summarize the lessons learned because I think we discussed a whole lot this morning. To start with, there is a big and then growing need for change. The world is moving on faster and faster and we're seeing disruption 
across any industry. Second, to innovate successfully or to transform, you need the right kind of structure. And don't compromise here. Get to a setup which is really working, otherwise it won't fly. Third, understand your strengths and play to those. Work with your capabilities to understand what is non cocon differentiating. Next, we have also been looking at the topic of understanding your customer's important but underserved needs. That needs to be the basis of innovation, not some absurd ideation, which are ultimately based on luck. We've also discussed the topic of business model innovation, which I invite you to leverage. Please download the United Business Model Innovation Patterns. And we equally discussed the main challenge of a digital transformation, which is to not just change one part of the business model, but reconfigure your entire business model so it's harmoniously working together again. Last but not least, many organizations confront me and tell me, well, dear Stefan, we don't have the money to innovate. Ultimately, what you have to do is save costs and standardize in the non-core areas and innovate where you really differentiate. Last but not least, don't be arrogant. When we are arrogant, we're not opening our minds and we need to open, open our minds when we innovate. If we know, if we would know what is happening in innovation and how we should be innovating, we are most likely not innovating anymore. We are just again in a horizon one. Everything that I've discussed this morning is basically a part of the book, How to Create Innovation. It's a fascinating piece because for the first time, this book is not a one trick pony looking at business model innovation and business models only, or it's not only looking at scrum or design thinking or whatever. It's looking at innovation end to end. It takes you from whiteboard to reality across all major domains. I've been the lead author of the book. 60 people have co-worked on it and it has mostly been a fascinating piece of research which we did over the last five years. The book is supported by numerous models alongside the Unite Navigator. You can download all of those models and many, many more. You have seen many today on digital leadership com slash unite. These models have been proven to be enormously, um, yeah, people just love those. So we're getting over 10,000 downloads. We share all of those down uh, open source, as I said, and please join us in our effort to create and share leading practices. So please be invited to share what you know best, what you would love to share with the wider community. We think it takes, I mean, hiding knowledge and keeping it to yourself is an outdated approach. We believe sharing is caring. So please join us in our effort to build and share the leading practices with the world at large. And if you share, of course, it will be shared under your name. You can put in there your branding and promote your organization as well if you want it. What we do at Digital Leadership we are the world's first open source consultancy. That's, I mean, we share open source and we are supporting organizations to achieve change. We are specialized on the topic of innovation and transformation and the related key disciplines, which is about brand and customer experience, culture and org changes, which is absolutely critical and how to align business and IT together. So they form a unanimous, um, whole and are uh, well aligned. This is what we do. And well, I hope this was highly interesting for you today and happy to support you as well, similar to other companies. So in the past, so we have been founded in 2010 
and um, yeah, have had quite a journey since and have managed to accompany some quite major organizations. Would be extremely happy to have a conversation with you, how we can help you on your initiative, on your innovation transformation initiative. We invite to reach out if you have questions and thank you very much for staying all the way and have a very good day and week. All the best. Thank you.